What is going on, you guys? Good afternoon. It is about 12.15 Eastern Standard Time here in the Mitten State. And uh, bring you guys another impromptu live stream. So hope everybody is staying safe, of course, there in the southern regions. Um, so definitely our thoughts and prayers go out to you, each and every one of the folks there uh, in Florida. Uh, but uh, with that being said, let's see who we got here in the chat. We got Sam the Fish Live. How you doing, buddy? I appreciate you stopping by. I uh, appreciate it very much. So uh, we met another uh, little milestone here on the Sergeant Tank YouTube channel. So definitely uh, very much appreciative to each one of you folks for uh, the continued support. So we are beyond the 1400 and uh, it, it's slow but sure, very organic um, growth. Uh, but uh, that is uh, all the much better. Um, so again, it's always uh, a blessing to see, uh, even on impromptu, the committed folks that we have to show up and support, uh, even when these things aren't scheduled. So uh, I do my best to try to get a video out to you guys uh, on a weekly basis. I have fallen behind uh, on putting a second video out for you guys um, this past week. So this is my way to make up for it, and hopefully we can get back on track here uh this uh next week so we have white in the house abby and uh we got uh ryland's aquariums hello so again uh we'll give it a few minutes before we get here on topic hopefully audio and video are doing okay for you guys uh and we don't have any issues this time with that We got King Lee's. Nice to see you again, buddy. Uh, let's see here. We got KG Cichlids. What's up, Kevin? So let me know uh, right now before we start getting too far into this uh, topic if audio and video is good for everybody. White is saying sound and video is good. That is great to hear. So hopefully you guys aren't picking up too much of the that's why I'm using this specific mic because it uh, is unidirectional. It should only pick up my voice and not uh, the ambient sound around, uh, which is more of a dynamic style mic. But we're not going to get into all of the audio logistics here. So we'll try to keep this fish related. Doing great. Uh, just started school again. And my teacher's awesome. I am pressing in as always, Abby. Uh, that's all I can promise and try to commit is I will press in. But thank you so much for asking. I'm glad to hear that uh, you are enjoying school and your teacher is doing good. Uh, Aqua World, hello. Have you ever bred apistos and can you keep them with guppies? Yes. Um, the uh, Microgeophagus germ blue rams is considered an apistogram of species. And uh, yes, I have kept different epistogrammas through the years. And with that being said, uh, anytime I breed, I always try to go back to the basics and keep it a species only tank. I would not recommend uh, if you're really trying to dive into any specific breeding project that you start going to the realm of uh, community style setups. But we will get more into talking about that here in a few moments. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> we got Aqua Apprentice. How you doing, buddy? Appreciate you so much for stopping by. Uh, let's see. Multi-tank addiction says, hello, fish fam. How you doing? Uh, once spent three hours researching the difference between two different types of mics, and now I forgot the names. Uh, the easiest way, Sam, uh, try not to be too much onto this. Um, my audio and video, I do understand all that stuff. I just try not to um, talk about it too much. Try to keep this uh, more or less a pet fish keeping related. But um, the easiest way to sum it up is you have basically an instrument style mic. Uh, you can actually utilize this uh, either for vocals when you're talking unidirectional. So this specific mic I'm using would be more acoustical 
uh, type of mic. So if you're playing like an acoustic guitar that doesn't have like a built-in pickup, you would actually uh, put this to, um, you know, right in front of that. If you can picture that, and of course that would pick up. So essentially it's picking up unidirectional, the actual uh, noise directly in front of it versus a dynamic style mic. Uh, which is picking up more of uh, the surrounding areas where it's almost doing like a, uh, a 180, if you can picture that, uh, which I have lots of different style mics, uh, which would be more considered a vocal style mic. So it just depends um, when I used to sing and so forth. I mean, um, I have a very loud voice to begin with, uh, especially when I used to sing and do different vocal and stuff like that. Um, I can literally keep the mic, you know, two feet away and it's still going to pick up because I have a very loud, um, uh, loud tone to begin with. And I think that just brings me back to when I used to teach and so forth. Um, never really even had to use a mic because I could generally speak quite loudly and so forth. But yeah, um, hopefully that kind of uh, explains. And of course, you can get into phantom power uh, and so forth, uh, which is uh, different. Um, but yeah, just do your research. Uh, what I would recommend if you're looking at live streaming mics is uh, do your due diligence and research. Uh, first and foremost, see what you can afford, what's in your, what's, what's within reason, and then um, look at other YouTubers that you enjoy the sound, and then compare, and then see what works within your budget. We got dank tanks in the house. Looks like your Fontos is already digging a hole. Oh yeah. Um. Uh, actually, no, that was, I'm not even paying attention, but yeah. So again, thank you, Kevin, uh, KG Cichlids hooked me up with this seven barred, um, Kigoma, um, species. It's, uh, I want to say it's species, uh, um, I'm going to butcher the name, but it's Siophilata. Tilapia or something like that. Uh, see why I'm not even going to try on visual, so I need to write it down. But if you guys want to specifically know, I can I can uh, write it down to tell you. But um, yeah. So anyway, um, really nice uh, frontosa there, and yeah. So all right. Let's see here. We got Danny's Aquariums. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Um, there you go. So I'll figure out would butcher that name. Um, but yes. Uh, let's see here. White said, awesome new stickers, Danny. Love the little pee poppers. Actually, I got rid of my pee poppers yesterday at auction which was kind of nice. So they went on to uh, actually Eric, who is um, part of our club and oftentimes uh, does a lot of supporting and so forth within the community here on YouTube uh, uh, with the different various YouTube fish keeping related channels. Um, he actually picked up two pea puffers. So he's got some larger puffers and so forth. But um, yeah. Uh, breeding rabbit snails. I don't specifically, I have one rabbit snail, but it got devoured, um, within seconds. Uh, but, uh, they only happen to come with something else I obtain. Um, I know most rabbit snail, uh, variations are a live bearing species and they're only going to produce, I want to say less than, uh, 10, uh, excuse me, less than 10 fry. Um, so they are a unique species. They do get fairly large. Um, but, uh, yeah, so hence the name rabbit snail. I don't know uh, why because they're, you know, I'm sure there's folks out there that have uh, them being like prolific breeders. But, I mean, I know that uh, Rob and Amanda through Flip Aquatics, um, of course, I have video out and other folks uh, too are in the warehouse. I know that they do a lot with um, breeding of, uh, different various of, uh, snails. I just personally, I don't have anything against them. Um, but I do more with like, uh, different variations of mystery snails. Um, but yeah, uh, we got bees aquatics. Hello, Jeff. Uh, hello. Uh, breed, 
I breed Plecos also. Any suggestions for dither fish? I've watched your videos on bristle nose and feeding. Moving forward with my old uh, plan with a rack of 15 and 20 longs for my breeders. Um, I don't feel that you need any dither fish with uh, with uh, most Pleco breeding. Um, however, we will get into dither fish and para breeding and so forth, or para bonding, I guess you would call it uh, great terminology. A para is working side by side. When you think of like a para pro, as a teacher, obviously they're working side by side with um, the uh, the primary teacher in the in the course or in that class. But yeah, we will get into para breeding and so forth and alternate breeding, I would talk. Um, but yeah, we can get more into talking about ancestress. That is a topic I could talk about an entire week on. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, did you move the turtle? There's, uh, they're now, yeah, they are back in their stock tank, larger, uh, hundred gallon stock tank. Yep. Uh, so I just have the, uh, Brontosa and I have a, uh, Zebra Daniel, uh, in here as well. Just kind of acting as a dither, um, to get this guy out and active. But, um, let's see here. Multi-tank addiction said going to go migrating fish to different tanks today and free up space for new fry. Thank you so much for your support, and I appreciate you very much for stopping by. I just want to stop by and show the fish fam love. Well, you have fun working in your fish room today. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, AMA Aquatics said multi. Let's see here. All right, so basically my whole basis around the channel is, again, I always put emphasis on me being a fish keeper for, I, I don't know, I lost track, over 20 years, um, heavily breeding different species of fish. That is my niche within the hobby, is breeding different various species of fish. Uh, those of which are more subtropical to cooler water temperatures, even into the tropical species of fish. So I have oftentimes people ask, Jeremy, what types of fish do you keep? And I have an entire list. Oftentimes I don't address all of them because once we publicly put out there what we have, especially if I have something a little bit more hard to come by, then everybody is asking, when are you going to breed it? I want this. I want that. Um, I really enjoy to kind of hoard most of those rare species until I have enough where I'm able to then offer. Um, so again, having a website makes it a little bit more challenging due to the fact that I try to keep up with demand and offering certain things and so forth uh, through the website. But you can always check back there often uh, to see what's available as far as livestock. So I haven't pushed a ton as far as sales on the website. Um, you will see more of that probably come the first of the year once I have more stuff available. Um, kind of a quick teaser here, nothing set in stone, but I will be able to offer hopefully here in the near future some very rare, more rare species and more hard to come by to offer to you guys through a very, very reputable breeder uh, that has been around uh, pre-1970s, since the early 70s, has been hardcore into breeding. That's one thing that's a blessing within our um, niche of this hobby and this community is we have some phenomenal, phenomenal, um, very reputable uh, individuals within this hobby. So I'm not going to address their names just out of confidentiality and so forth, uh, not until I would get the okay to do that so most of these guys um uh you know were um looks like uh not sure what, not sure what happened there but uh we'll get that straightened out danny um i'm sure it was just a uh yeah uh we'll get it straightened out danny give me a few minutes here um just you got to let YouTube catch up. Um, things happen, <laughs> but you'll be back in the chat in no time at all. So it uh, looks like uh, Ken Lee took care of it. So, all right, we're back on topic here, uh, <laughs> but no worries at all, Ken Lee. I know I've been there. We've all been there. 
Uh, that's why I had to take the wrench away from dank tanks because that was happening too often. Uh, looks like we got my, my buddy Nick in the house. What's going on, Nick? Uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so it was actually brought up last night at the club. Uh, once we got talking a little bit after the auction and we're paying our dues and so forth um, on the auction items, uh, we got talking a little bit uh, uh, in somehow the website and so forth came up and then they this particular individual had asked uh, to work with me and potentially offering some things uh, because I addressed due to the fact I've been shipping for a lot of years and I enjoy the ship to be able to start offering some things to other hobbyists. So one of the things I picked up, which you guys will see sometime here in a future video, is the um, orange liar tail killifish, um, which is a kind of a hard to come by killifish and this individual breeds them um, quite often and the uh, electric blue acara uh, is actually where I got the pair of electric blue acaras from the same individual uh, so but yeah I mean uh, really just a lot of phenomenal things and this is only one individual so I mean there is some really really uh, reputable breeders uh, through our club some old timers that have been around in the hobby for uh, quite some time. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's awesome to, uh, to have that and, and so forth. But, all right, so let's get back here on, um, kind of thought I would share that with you guys, but getting back here on, on topic to stay focused. So uh, some methods that I recommend is basically you have your different types of species, whether if they're egg scattering species, if they're an egg, like a mouth brooding species, if they're a spawning species, if they're a sand type dwelling species, if they're more of a substrate layer, um, you know, if they're more of a labyrinth species, such as like a bubble nest breeder. So you have different variations of species and how they go about breeding. So that is one thing that you need to keep in mind when you're obtaining a fish is realize that some are going to be a little bit more challenging than others and we're not even talking about water parameters at this point we're just talking about the different variations and how they go about actually um, spawning and then how the reproduction process actually occurs uh, with these different uh, species of fish and of course you have your live bearing species so that is going to include uh, your shrimp um, that's going to, of course, you include like your, like your guppies and, uh, your endlers and your platies and so on and so forth. But, um, even with guppies, I mean, the misconception out there and I've even myself getting back into, um, some of those types of live bearing species is through different genetic lines and obtaining different genetic lines from other hobbyists is um, without really trying to focus too much on genetic lines and line breeding and stuff, um, they can even be challenging to ensure that you're getting uh, the right strains that you're looking for. Uh, so again, even though that it's a guppy, and yes, we know that they are prolific breeders, uh, the, the question I don't really think in the hobby remains, hey, are they difficult to breed? I mean, uh, pretty much you put them in a bucket and they're going to breed, but where the challenge comes in is producing the right lines that are suiting your needs and whatever you're trying to reproduce uh, at that point in time in your hobby. Um, so let's focus, I guess, on Ancestors Placos. So we can spend about five or ten minutes talking about different species of the um, Hype Ancestors and Ancestors Placos and so forth. I have been breeding them specifically well over a decade 12 years continuously that is one of the things that is the most uh, profitable I find if somebody asks me Jeremy what would you consider to be the most profitable fish um, in the hobby to produce that's always in a constant demand that can handle pretty wide range of water parameters in where you can get the yield that you're looking for if given the appropriate environment and setup and as well as a good community breeder uh, with other fish, which we'll get to here in just a few moments. That would be your basic ancestors placos. 
So again, we're not going to get into the different classifications. Uh, this is where your guys' due diligence comes in to do the research in understanding this. So there's plenty of articles, there's plenty of um, uh, literature out there in order for you guys to identify and understand the differences between your common ancestors plecos, your hype ancestors plecos, your other L numbers of plecos, and so forth. But I'm just talking your bare bone basic um, and sisters plecos, which could be classified as your brown, they can be classified as your chocolate, your albinos, um, your super reds, your long fins, uh, and so forth, is before even food is I recommend um, bare minimum, uh, if you're going to start out with a trio, is a 20 long. And a trio, obviously, is uh, one male to two females. So if you can picture a 20 long, I've already done videos on this and live streams multiple times. But uh, in case you guys haven't seen that, we'll just go through a real, real uh, crash course here really quick. Is a 20 long, um, and I recommend uh, either tapping, um, drilling that tank, and or making yourself a very simple, cheap DIY um, do-it-yourself overflow in order to get the old water out. Uh, the reason I say that is uh, once you set up the tank, understand how to set it up. We're not going to go through all that. Um, but obviously you have some form of structure in there, whether that be uh, rot piles, plants, um, spawning caves, so forth. You're going to have to go back and look at other videos if you want to know more about that or live stream is you want to be able to get that old wastewater out of there. Is I change on the majority of my uh, heavily stocked community breeding setups that are very seasoned, um, which I've, again, I've talked about multiple times, is uh, uh, one of which is a 55 and another one is a 40 breeder. Those guys are on continuous um, automated drip system. So I'm constantly changing the water and I would approximate that I'm changing in the 55 anywhere between 100 and 120 gallons of water within a 24-hour to 30-hour period. Um, what that's doing is that is constantly triggering them uh, to spawn. It's constantly getting them in the mode. Um, I provide enough nooks and crannies. That specific tank that I'm talking about, the 55, that I've done plenty of videos on and I've talked about before. Um, so again, I can't put emphasis on this enough is water changes is key in order to reproduce that's i'm telling you what has worked for me through a lot of different theories that have been out there in the hobby through just real practical hands-on experiences what it comes down to um, theory to me doesn't matter until i've proven that theory is relevant within my own home aquaria um, so again simplicity is key don't overcomplicate it they are a very simple species to breed given the appropriate environment. But I find water changes are key, frequent, consistent, and low drip throughout. So I'm not doing like a like a quick 80% water change. That's where you're going to potentially run into problems. This is over, again, a 24-hour to a 30-hour time frame. And again, I don't need to adjust it. It's already been fine-tuned what works for me. But without getting into your TDS and your pH and your carbonate hardness and your alkalinity and your acidic levels and so forth, again, there's so many different variables. I'm just telling you within my home uh, query what works for me. And uh, again, you might have to fine tune how much water you're changing. The main key thing, uh, not only with Placos, I find, is consistency throughout every one of your tanks. So where I see people having issues is where they're doing like a trigger spawn through um, doing a quick uh, reduction of water. So let's say you're doing a 20%, 50% water change. You might be adding reverse osmosis, DNI, deionized water in order to uh, bring up, uh, bring down your overall alkalinity and bring up your acidic level. Uh, they try to help sometimes with certain species to trigger them to spawn to kind of mimic that rainy season. Because when you think about rain being more acidic uh, and so forth, um, is if you're doing it frequent and constant and, and you know, let's back up here. So what I mean by consistency is if you get, for instance, a half gallon or a one gallon per hour 
drip emitter and you put that into, let's say, your 20 long, for instance, um, I would find that that would be sufficient enough, uh, depending on your bio load, how well the, the tank is seasoned. So again, there is variables in this. Is they will, I can get my uh, specific ancestors to start reproducing right around um, seven to eight months of age. So I look at more at age rather than size. I have found that uh, the misconception out there is that they have to be at two and a half, three inches. That is just a very common misconception because I have proven that time and time again, it's false. Um, it's all about age. Yes, your clutch numbers are going to be reduced based on just practicality, the size of the, the female and the way that she's able to hold, um, you know, and, and, and keep those eggs obviously is going to be different versus a larger, more adult female. Uh, you know, again, they will because of the hormonal levels and the pheromones that are released within um, the aquarium, they are going to be stunted and reduced as far as uh, how they grow. Because oftentimes I have folks say, Jeremy, or if I'm listening to uh, live streams, they're not growing. Chances are you're feeding fine. The issue is you're not providing enough consistent overall water changes. Um, so again, one thing I've found with Ancestors Plecos is frequent, consistent water changes. So let's get here to the chat before we go on too much more because I want to make sure that I clear up any confusion that there might be and I'll try to reiterate if I need to. Uh, so again, this is your guys' opportunity to pick my brain and ask me any questions based on what we talked about up to this point. see here we got big easy what's going on mark we got dpk aquariums what's going on dude uh just working hours let's see here um, damien hello uh How do I tell when to move a live bear to a breeding box? I don't want to put it in for a long uh, because I don't want uh, to stress it out. Um, usually most live bearing species, if you're talking about uh, guppy or a platy, specifically guppies are going to be more square. So without having some type of visual aid, you're going to have to go and just do the Google research in uh, pull up images is the best resource I would say. So if you Google that specific term or phrase it in order to find the appropriate image, then you will know when they're more boxy and they're pretty much looking like they're ready to explode. Uh, then you know at that point to go ahead and you can introduce them into a fry box if that's the route that you want to go. And then once the fry are then released, of course, they would fall down below. If you can picture just your basic fry box. I don't specifically do that. I utilize... 10 and 12 inch, which of course we carry on our website. Um, so a little plug there, but uh, they're very uh, easy to make too, but a lot of people don't want to spend the time to make them. So they're 100% uh, acrylic, um, just your basic standard um, uh, yarn style spawning mops. And then I keep a lot of live plants in there as well um, in conjunction with that. And I find most of the time the fry are left alone. So um, I have a hundred gallon stock tank that's designated just to guppies and fry. And that thing is got live plants in it. It's got, uh, uh, and citrus placos in it. It's got snails in it. So, uh, a season setup, but again, it's not uh, necessarily practical for everybody there. So I don't specifically myself, uh, with that method utilize, um, uh, you know, like a fry uh, box, uh, but you, it's more and more than okay and sufficient to do it. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, my angels are spun again, but this time I'm not letting the male eat the eggs. Uh, yeah, our discus, our, our pigeon blood pair discus, um, you know, they eat the eggs. I know that the eggs are fertile because I've already proven that they're fertile uh, from the very get-go. But again, I'm not giving up. So this is probably their fifth time spawning. Um, i I could have pulled them. I could have done it. Probably had a yield of 90% or greater. 
I'm confident in that. Um, but I don't find that they're a difficult species at all to breed. Um, I think it really comes down to genetic lines. It comes down to husbandry of where you obtain the fish from. Um, chances are, I mean, again, in theory, if you look at it from that standpoint, is if it's from myself or from another hobbyist, somebody who really puts the attentiveness and care into whatever species that they're keeping. Uh, chances are, if they're line breeding, if they're producing really good um, genetic lines and they've um, are seasoned in the hobby and they're providing the right conditions. Uh, once you obtain the fry from that specific uh, specimen, most likely you're going to have similar success within your own um, home aquarium as long as you try to uh, adapt to similar water parameters from which you obtain them from. So again, that's where I think simplifying the hobby is, is number one. Um, don't overcomplicate it. Just try to replicate, duplicate the success that that individual is having within your own home aquarium, and then you should have overall success. Let's see. We got Kevin in the house. How you doing, Kevin? Um, gator tracks. Uh, fresh cut, man. Yep. Got to keep it clean. Uh, I look like I'm 12 years old if I don't uh, keep it. Um, but, uh, yeah. What is the most difficult placo to breed in regards to parameters? Um, that I can't speak of, Kevin, just due to the fact I haven't bred um, a lot of other ancestors' placos besides your common. Um, so I, I know that there's theories and I know that there's stories of who has difficult times breeding one thing. Uh, could be your zebra placos, for instance. Um, I know uh, an individual who breeds them. Um, and is very good at breeding them. Um, but again, uh, I think really given the right conditions, the source that you obtain them from, um, not overcomplicating it, just doing your due diligence as a hobbyist, um, I don't find that really there's too much out there that's difficult to do. Um, I mean, people have been doing it for a lot of years. It's just how much time do you want to invest? So first and foremost, understand what you're keeping and how they breed, as I was talking about earlier. So rather if they're mop spawners, if they're elaborate species, if they're cave spawners, if they're more of a rock spawning species, if they're going to uh, dwell themselves in the sand, if they're a, you know, um, th there's, there's different uh, mouth brooders, live bearing species. So understanding first and foremost how the fish actually spawns, the anatomy makeup of the fish. Um, I don't look at... Uh, just to put emphasis on that again, um, you'll hear me oftentimes uh, talk about, and you can argue with me until you're blue in the face, I will never back down on this. Um, but if you're obtaining something that is captive bred, stop mimicking wild-caught parameters. Chances are the individual that's keeping them in a captive bred environment has either conditioned them over if they were initially like an F0 wild-caught specimen, to their water environment because you're never going to 100% be able to mimic unless you're actually obtaining exactly the mineral content, the overall total dissolved solid makeup from, let's say if it's an African cichlid from Lake Tanganyika or something like that. Unless you're literally right next to Lake Tanganyika and your aquarium set up there, stop mimicking that. Condition them over. I'm keeping right now and I can breed successfully your common electric yellow lab labidochromis, I'm keeping those guys at about 68 to 72 degrees. I'm not even joking. I don't keep heaters in most of my tanks. I'm getting back to the basics, and those guys are collared up. They're eating fine. Their metabolism's fine. I'm not concerned about them at all. Um, once we get heat in that specific fish room, um, come wintertime, um, again, we have too many fluctuations, so I'm not going to be installing the... Uh, the heater at this point uh, due to the fact that they're talking close to 80 again this coming week. Uh, but with that being said, um, again, right now it's just finding the appropriate balance and the right time to go about doing that. So again, they will eventually get back up to probably about 75, 77 degrees. Um, I don't care about the backlash from other folks. That doesn't, I don't lose sleep. You know, I'm not one... 
um, you know, if I'm showing off a setup. The reason I don't show off a lot of my tanks is due to the fact is LG growth, whether if that's Blackbeard LG, um, just your common hair LG, um, whatever type of LG is in there, I don't care. They love it. Um, if you're talking a natural ecosystem, a natural environment, do that um, rather than trying to constantly alter and adjust your water. Um, because again, TDS is whatever you make it. It's, it's, you, you don't know, I don't know, nobody definitively knows unless you're a 12 year um, like biologist and a chemist that actually has the appropriate lab set up to identify exactly what all the dissolved make, makeup is in your tank. Nobody truly knows. So again, really, it's just a baseline and it's a number at the end of the day. That's why me, I don't focus a great, great deal on pH. Um, I do focus on TDS to a point as a baseline, but I kind of factor in everything as a whole. Um, and at the end of the day, as long as if it's not broke, I'm not going to fix it. If my fish are healthy, they're displaying normal behaviors, um, they're reproducing. Oftentimes, that's a key indicator if you're getting fry reproduction and you're getting a good yield on those fry that's a great indicator that you're doing something right um uh, i love snails in every one of my systems so again without going into all of that that's where i really enjoy a natural ecosystem so i love snails in my tanks they really do a great job uh they kind of act as a cleanup crew so uh yeah We got Chris. How you doing, buddy? Um, all right. Uh, no, I don't breed any uh, uh, tilapia AMA. Uh, let's see. Kevin said he loves snails until we get a pond. I, I just let those bad boys go crazy. Um, when you're getting sea shrimp, or also known as certain, there's different, uh, again, Daphnia is really a type of sea shrimp is really what it is. They have a really type um, hard carapace that's on them. Um, I have sea shrimp in a lot of my Neocaridina shrimp tanks. I, I know an easy way to just um, nuke them if you want to a couple of different ways um, and I can clean it up within 24 hours, they're gone. Put some guppy fry in there and they'll devour them. Um, they're a great nutritional source. And if you want to, not necessarily facts, but if you want to point out history and background when it comes to sea shrimp, again, I oftentimes hear the misconception, sea shrimp are horrible. Actually, sea shrimp is a great indicator that you have a really well-established ecosystem going on. Uh, same thing with snails. Um, so again, don't take it from me, do your due diligence and research, but again, I don't get too alarmed over sea shrimp. Um, they're really a beneficial uh, food source for certain fry, uh, but yeah, so um, all right. Gina Tucker, hello. <sighs> then we hate, hate, hate snails. <laughs> Kevin, if you got snail reproduction going on, you're doing something right, buddy. Uh, I had a ram's horn snail breeding tank. Had tons of snails. I put some tilapia fry in there, and they eat in the snails. They can get in their mouths. Absolutely. Yep. That, to me, is a natural ecosystem. So let the algae go crazy. Let... Let everything just go crazy <laughs> naturally based on whatever lighting you're using. I will have a video coming out. I'm going to try to edit that today. It's going to be another short video. Um, you guys are going to have to let me know in the videos. Are you liking the short videos? I know what YouTube likes because I've been doing studies on this. I, I understand what YouTube likes. I want to know what you guys like. Um, so, again, this channel is growing uh, slow, uh, but again, it's it's growing organically, uh, which is fine. I know some reasons behind the reason why the channel is growing slower, um, but again, that's what I love to test because before I even 
um, did the impromptu live stream. That's where I'm so blessed as a YouTuber and as a creator. Um, going on a few months now of doing this whole YouTube thing and joining that bandwagon and got behind the scenes, you know, from behind the scenes and actually putting out video is I'm not looking for Steven Steel Spiel production at this point. Maybe someday I'll get more into um, that type of stuff. But right now, I just enjoy fish keeping. I enjoy sharing the hobby with you guys, my ups and downs, what works, what doesn't work. Um, trust me. Uh, if you guys don't think I lose fry, if I don't lose fish, I do. Um, I can promise you I do. We all go through it. Uh, so you're going to have your ups and downs. You're going to have your 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 trials and errors and, and so forth. But um, Floyd the Tank Boy doesn't preferably like uh, short videos. So the seven to eight minute videos, what I would rather do is rather than getting everything stretched out over a 45 minute time frame, which YouTube does not like, um, is getting things to a point in practicality is getting things within maybe around a 10 minute video. So of course my watch time, my viewership and so forth has gone down due to the fact is I haven't, sub count has gone a little bit up. Um, again, it's a slow but gradual. Um, the problem is when you're getting certain um, traction your way and, you know, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. I mean, if you guys want to know uh, my thoughts on it and so forth, then that's fine. But, you know, I really want to stay on topic as much as we can. So uh, Kevin likes the editing style. Yeah, I mean, I can do the editing. I don't think it's difficult. It's just something I don't enjoy to do. That's just me. Um, I can learn it. I mean, I used to run a $20,000 intellect system back in my old profession. So, I mean, uh, as far as computers and stuff go, I mean, this is really nothing to me. It's just a matter of taking the time to learn it. Um, I'm paying for, uh, you know, Adobe Photoshop, which I've used maybe three times. Unfortunately, I can't back out of that. So if anybody's interested in Adobe Photoshop, unless you have like a 12-year degree and you've studied it or pick up on things really quick, don't do it. Um, there's other things out there, but I learned the hard way. So I'm just telling that with you guys. So I'm spending like 11 bucks a month. That's automatically debited through our PayPal account uh, for something I, I can't use. If I break the contract and I should have read the fine print, I was thinking I had like a trial phase so I can go ahead and back out if I wanted to after the first month. If it wasn't really anything that appealed to me for the first 11 bucks for the first month, it really didn't matter to me at the end of the day because it was just 11 bucks and it was worth that investment to me to see if it was something I watch a lot of videos there is tutorials out there but there's just nobody I like that really breaks it down the way I like to learn so um, people need to start if they're gonna teach start from the bare bones tree the way I used to teach is even if I went into a different position I would always it didn't matter if I had 10 more years of experience than that other person my mentality was teach me as if I'm completely green that I'm brand new, that I have no idea. Um, that's the way, teach from the beginning. And that, to me, is kind of the summing up the whole video concept that I'm doing now is like, I wanted to show you guys the basics. I want to show you what works for me. And then as far as diving, if it's not anything that really takes, like the last video with the uh, air system, I don't feel as if I had to really start diving into too much more of a breakdown. It's pretty self-explanatory, pretty much common sense at the end of the day. Um, if you guys needed more of a elaborative breakdown, then that's where you're going to have to comment. Ask me your questions, and I'll try to elaborate that way. If I start getting enough feedback where somebody wants like a specific breakdown, um, maybe within that setup, then I would have to then most likely take the time and go ahead and do like a video on it. Um, but I was, I had different angles. I was trying different things. I had three different cameras running and I was just like, you know what? I want to get back to my roots, keeping it simple, you know, keep it simple. Stupid is really just a, uh, method I've lived on all my life. Uh, you know, to stop over complicating it. So, um, as long as I could get the image out there and get the information out there for what worked for me anyway, then that was, you know, more power. Uh, to me at the end of the day, I guess.
All right, a thousand of these snails, um, even gotten assassin snails and loaches to get rid of them, and they are out producing the predators. Uh, let's see here. One big one again. I suck third one to add, secure one at few parents, but they eat them. But not yet, fourth one. I think I will let one week with parents in the community tank. I put crush eggshells in my guppy tank um, from Lucas from LR Bratz for shrimp and snails. Yep, you can do that method. Um, I find, based on our municipal water source, the best thing that I find for calcification. Um, not only to promote uh, the appropriate calcium, I don't add Tom's, I don't add any calcium supplements, I don't feel that it's necessary to do it. Um, I think that you need to find a balance in that. But again, you guys do what you want to at the end of the day. Um, that's completely your prerogative. But I'm not going to change the way I'm doing it. I do one pound of crushed coral per 10 gallons of water. I find the sustainability over the longevity of it over a long period is much more sufficient and much uh, better than adding a bunch of unnecessary products um, that are really just there to entice people to buy a product. So um, I could, you know, you, <laughs> if you want me to, I can sit here and try to sell you guys this pen. You know, I, I got a pretty good sales pitch at the end of the day, but, you know, um, I don't really, don't get me wrong, there's companies out there that are great, but I think a lot of this stuff, probably 80% of it, um, is nonsense. I don't feel that you need it. If we look back for hundreds of years, and even really when the hobby really started taking off and evolving, um, you know, let's say even from the 70s or from the 60s, you know, up to this point, how did they do it for so many years without all of these products? People need to go back to the roots, go back to those individuals that created. Uh, more or less this thing that we call fish keeping, keeping glass boxes. Uh, those are the individuals I truly, truly um, respect and I learn from and I grow from. That's why I always say I'm like pre-1990 kind of guy um, uh, when it comes to fish keeping. We got Dwayne in the house, and Dwayne is definitely one of those individuals. If you want to learn, go to Dwayne. He does Saturday live streams right now, so... Um, you know, again, I have to go back and listen, but grab a pen and paper and, uh, and start to learn. So, uh, Dwayne is a great individual to definitely, um, from a old school veteran perspective, uh, would be an individual. I definitely highly recommend that you go and pick the brain and, uh, try to identify maybe some, some old school ways, uh, if you're having some challenges, uh, AMA Aquatics says snails in a tank. If they are thriving, shows you doing something right. Yep, wasn't you. Would know about the problem further down the road. Uh, let's see. We got Angela in the house. How you doing, Angela? Uh, let's see. Uh, Floyd the Tank Boys said content is far more important than quality of video. Yep. Um... You, you do see different changes now with the YouTube algorithm. You know, when I first started, it was a little bit different um, to where it is now because I just started producing video um, and I didn't put any time into it. I mean, if you go back to uh, very first videos, I mean, it's it's clear. That's why I leave them there. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah. You know, I don't want to get on the politics of it. I mean, you look at other content, and you're like, how is this individual where they're at? But you, that's where, as I've said before, you can't compare yourself to somebody else. Um, you know, I guess that's where grace comes in at the end of the day. Be happy and proud and not envious because uh, that's not going to help you at the end of the day. So I guess you just have to look at it, that there's something that that individual is obviously doing right. Um, didn't just happen by mistake. Um, you know, if they're, if they're successful and they're doing something Maybe you want to start adjusting your things a little bit differently uh, to maybe try to kind of mimic, you know, what somebody else is doing. I don't know. Could be completely wrong, but just my thoughts. 
Uh, let's see here. KG said your Kagoma should go nuts for a bloodworm cube. How's he eating, by the way? Just uh, slowly introducing. I uh, wanted his uh, metabolism to kind of balance out uh, just from the stress and so forth. Um, I don't like start hammering foods right away. I want to slowly ease into it because my biggest concern is dealing with uh, most um, larger breeds of cichlids because I have kept different various cichlids. I'm definitely a cichlid guy to heart, and I've definitely dealt with my fair share of issues of bloat, um, imbalances of diet, and so forth. But, yes, he is. Um, she's eating quite well, so. Uh, we got uh, KP Aquariums. What's going on, KP? I've uh, been being busy pulling fish room apart and rearranging things so to take more room, set up the tilapia breeding section. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. Dwayne is a man, KP Aquarium said. I concur. Uh, AMA Think said before my grandfather has tropical fish in the greenhouse with no heaters and tanks, and I use rainwater. I uh, kept them all year round, and they breed like mad. All right, looks like I caught up in chat. So, uh, yeah, any other questions on my thoughts and my experiences when it comes to breeding of different species of fish and more or less the methods, not necessarily the specific species? Um, is I focus more on understanding method, and then you can adapt that to species. So hopefully that makes sense. Understand the different various methods and how fish reproduction and their anatomy makeup actually coincides with uh, your home aquaria and, and how you need to introduce and how you need to go about doing it. So... Uh, the thing I mentioned at the beginning is para bonding. So para, meaning P-A-R-A, -A, obviously the Greek term for basically working side by side as you think about like a pair, pair pro or a pair professional, um, rather if that be with a professor, a teacher, uh, what have you, they're working side by side with the primary individual there. So para bonding or um, para breeding is a... The way, the way I simplify it is um, they're working together more or less in unison in order to successfully raise. Um, so there's many different Lake Tanganyikan species, which I learned a great deal from. Um, uh, John Kepper, which actually came and talked yesterday and does a phenomenal job on breaking down the different ways and methods and his own experiences through the years when it comes to uh, breeding and raising certain fry um, and so forth. But without getting into species specific is I utilize again because I've been, I got to go back to my roots and that's dealing with certain ancestral species. So when it comes to Placos is I have gotten them to the point, that's why I've had people ask, um, is there a specific reason why you design your, um, why you design your breeding caves the way that you do? I have never really seen that specific design it's a very simple design and if anybody's wondering what i'm talking about you're gonna have to go on my repertoire videos and take a look um but basically if you can picture a basic slate spawning cave and then right down and basically goes on a diagonal so from corner to corner and then what that does is i have a removable top so again they uh so you Utilizing, let's say, if you have like a group of six in there, is oftentimes if you have, let's say, three females, two males, four females, two males, what have you, um, it could be a trio, it could be a reverse trio. So a trio obviously is one male, two females. A reverse trio is the opposite. So two males to one female. Um, so let's use that that pair of breeding or pair of, pair of bonding in a sense is basically um, – uh, the reverse trio. So if you want to, I wouldn't recommend anybody starting out. It's just my own personal recommendation is to do a reverse trio if you've never bred uh, ancestors before. Start out with a basic bare bone um, setup. Uh, keep it simple. Start out with a trio. But let's say you've gotten beyond that. So what I have found is they'll actually, the two males will actually um, work together 
uh, when it comes to breeding is basically if you can picture and understand that they course the female and the female will lay, they'll kick the female out and then they'll go ahead and then uh, raise up those fry. The reason I pull the fry and I pull the eggs, which I've done a video on before, is I want that fish, that placo, to get back into the routine of eating again because they will literally not eat that entire time, even when the fry become um, eaten through the egg sac and basically become a free swimming state at that point. So from a wiggler to a free swimming state, they'll still course the fry in there because they're very, very protective. They're very good at raising up the fry. They're not going to eat them. So um, with that being said, is that's why I'll go ahead and pull. But if you're going to leave them in their own natural environment and you want them to raise, that's why I recommend a reverse trio because what that will do is that will give an opportunity for the two males to work hand in hand. So when you slowly introduce food back into the tank, they'll actually start working in conjunction with one another. You can train them to do so over time. Is I've seen this on time and time again is a male will actually leave, another male will then come in. And again, a lot of it just comes down to personality traits. It's not a definite guarantee that you're going to have that happen with all of them. But if you really understand the behaviors of your fish, and that goes for other species of fish too. That's not just placos. I'm just using that as an example. Uh, you can really find really, really cool in understanding the body language of your fish. Uh, so again, that kind of gives a brief explanation, really summing it up uh, to simplify it is, is basically pair breeding. So um, when you think about like a mouth brooding species or something like that is um, in order to eat, there's certain uh, pair bonding species that will actually pass the fry from one uh, fish to the next so they can eat, have the opportunity to eat. For instance, like your basic yellow lab, Labidochromis, is uh, the female can still eat and they'll more or less shift the fry off to the side. So if you're not going to strip the fry, me personally, I would strip the fry. That's just me um, to uh, get that fish back in the mode of eating again. Because the worst thing I want to see, especially with, uh, with Placos, I find, is once they get uh, depletion of diet, that's where my concern comes in. I've seen too many fish die due to not eating for a long period of time. So especially with my methods and the way I go about feeding, I don't hammer foods. I always underfeed and overfeed. And you've heard me talk about that time and time again. So I'm not one to overfeed. I try to find a balance. So I really only feed these guys. Um, for instance, like the Placos, I feed them basically once a week. Um, and then they will live off from that food uh, for about three or four days. And the reason I can do that and I can hammer them uh, so not, I guess, look at it this way. It's like I'm literally feeding, but they're kind of uh, scavenging on that food over a course of that week, if that makes sense. So it's not like I'm feeding, literally putting food in the tank every single day. Hopefully that kind of um, sums things up. So um, I do that with most of my tanks. I uh, want to say right now we have over 50 actual breeding tanks throughout, and I have different various species. I have killifish, I have incisors placos, I have shrimp, snails, um, uh, mycogeophagus, I got endlers, I have, um, gosh, I'm trying to think, uh, I got some labyrinth species, I got the uh, blue paradise fish or the blue paradise gourami. Um, what else do we have? Um, yeah, lots of different stuff. I lose track, so I would have to look at my notebook uh, to tell you exactly what all we have right now, but that's my joy. That's my niche. That's what I love to do is breed. Try new things out. Try to see what works. Try to push the envelope to the point where uh, somebody, I will always accept the challenge because when somebody says, hey, you are not able to do it this way, and I'm thinking, you know what? Watch me. So, again, I accept the challenge when it comes to most species um, just due to the fact that I've had my experience within the hobby long enough to understand that when you take on an undertaking of breeding, um, keep it simple, don't overcomplicate it, and don't get discouraged when you start losing fry. That's why I always start out with a group. Expect that you're going to lose two or three from the beginning just through aggression. It could be through imbalances in diet. It could be through stress of shipment. 
Uh, just a lot of variables there. So always start out with a group. Don't start out with a bare minimum, um, and uh, you should have success. Let's see. Uh, Dwayne said, do you follow the online of thinking that the breeding of fish is seasonal and you can take advantages of artificially create seasons in your tank? Um, absolutely. I don't look at um, the effects of the climate changes. I think that there's certain, um, uh, what is it, the, the term I'm looking for? Uh, the Dwayne has talked about it uh, plenty of occasions. Um, the starts with a B. Anyways, the pressure and the climate changes of the actual natural environment, depending on your your um, your uh, elevation and where you're at uh, within the world and so forth. Yes, I feel that there's certain certain things that can happen naturally from the environment that can help trigger. However, I'm one to basically get my fish to breed when I want them to breed, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. Hopefully that kind of makes sense, but yes. Uh, KP Aquarium said, I'm male and three females and 20 long. Nothing what I am not. Uh, you got to give them time. Um, again, if you're just popping in, if you didn't hear, is consistent, frequent water changes. Um, the best thing I can recommend is go back in my repertoire videos. And uh, you can even look by, I have playlists created for just about everything. So I've talked about my methods and what has brought me success for the years uh, specifically. So if you just search um, Placo or put in Incisorus in the search uh, under my video, then it should bring up all the different videos that I've talked about. And that'll help, help you a little bit more. Uh, well, I have difference. First of all, I'm using um, dry uh, infos. Okay, it looks like we have some chat going on, which is great to see. Um, KG said, yeah, it seems that Rapashu works really well for quarry cats. Uh, but I guess you could feed pretty much anything as long as you're keeping up on maintenance. I also give them baby brine shrimp. Uh, let's see. You sir have a lot of tanks. Um, uh, put morning wood repashing my 20 long for brisk nose, but my quarries really like it too. Is that a problem? No. I mean, if that works for you. Uh, let's see. Chris said, I feed from 6 to, 12, 6 to 12 a day. If miss feeding, I provide them repashi. Um, yes, barometric pressure. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, I don't want to sound like a fool and mispronounce that, so yes. Uh, try keeping the temp around 74 to 76, Chris. Uh, see if your bridge knows like to start breeding by usually breeding that temp. Um, okay, you guys must be talking about bristle nose. Uh, yeah, lots of videos, um, Chris, if that's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, Bristol knows to me, uh, I think we need to have a competition. Um, it would be fun to have like competition, in the community, cause I know like, uh, like, uh, flip aquatics, um, I know that they're running their, uh, their shrimp competition, um, which I have about six, 700, um, uh, fry already, uh, from them. So I won't get into all of the different uh, ways I go about bringing specifically, um, see where at. Yeah. Time wise, um, just not going to have the time today, but I have already talked about that anyways in the previous video and how I go about successfully breeding and rearing of, um, fry. And I have videos out, uh, for Neocaridina specifically. So, um, similar methods as the, uh, but a little bit different. Ah, uh, let's see. All right. Any last minute questions?
questions, you guys, and we're going to wrap this up. I want to appreciate you guys very much. We're up on an hour. I'm not sure, probably a little bit over that. Time definitely flies, but I'm going to wrap this up and get back to it. So I really want to appreciate each and every one of you guys, as always, for joining me on another impromptu live stream. This will be most likely the live stream for the week. So I did switch it up. Um, I usually have been doing the last couple of weeks impromptu sometime on a Tuesday. Uh, we'll try to get back on a routine. I know I keep saying that. You're just going to have to bear with me. And uh, everybody down there in Florida, Carlos, uh, each one of you guys, definitely stay safe. Our thoughts and prayers, make sure that you use good common sense and judgment and obviously get yourself to a safe place. So um, I have lots of patience because Frontessa grows slow, and now I'm starting to get impatient. <laughs> All right. Much love, you guys, and we'll talk to you right back here on the next one. If for whatever reason there's any other questions that come up and you want to rewatch this or anybody later on, of course, the best thing you can do is go ahead and um, put that in the comment section below. Uh, down in the description, you can also find our website uh, for various dry goods and livestock as well as um, you can uh, find my email uh, link there as well. So. Uh, we'll talk to you guys right back here on the next one. Um, again, have a great week, everybody.